Awakening to the drama and understanding the meaning is the middle vehicle. Cultivating in accord with drama is a great vehicle. To penetrate the 10,000 dramas entirely and completely while remaining without defilement, and to sever attachment to the marks of all the dramas with nothing whatsoever gained in return. That is the supreme vehicle. Vehicles are methods of practice, not subjects for debate. Cultivate on your own and do not ask me for at all times. Your own self-nature is itself thus. Chu Chang bowed and thanked the master and served him to the end of the master's life. Commentary. The master said, Chu Chang, the drama doesn't even have one vehicle, much less four. Pupils' minds are what differ. If you see, hear, and recite, you belong to the small vehicle. If you understand and awaken, you belong to the middle vehicle. If you practice in accord with the drama, you belong to the great vehicle. When you understand all dramas, when they are protected in your own mind without any obstruction, and when you know that the 10,000 dramas are the mind, and the mind is the 10,000 dramas, and further, when you are not defined by any state, then you belong to the supreme vehicle. But you must cultivate on your own. I can't do it for you. Eat your own food and fill yourself, and your own birth and death. From that time on, Chu Chang served the master. When he wanted a cup of tea, Chu Chang brought it for him. When he was hungry, Chu Chang brought him food. He served the master right up until the master's death, at which time he left Nanhua Temple. Bishu Chu Tao Sutra Bishu Chu Tao, a native of, of Nanhai in Guangzhou, asked a favor. Since leaving home, your student has studied the Nibbana Sutra for over ten years and has still not understood its great purport. I hope that the High Master will bestow his instruction. The Master said, What point haven't you understood? Chu Tao replied, All activities are impermanent, characterized by production and extinction. When production and extinction are extinguished, that still extinction is bliss. My doubts are with respect to this passage. Commentary Once in the past, during the period when Shakyamuni Buddha was cultivating to plant causes for the attainment of Buddhahood, he was a Brahman. Deep in the mountains, he cultivated many drama draws, so heroically that the god Chakra was moved and said, He worked so hard, I wonder if I can break him, and he transformed himself into a Rakshasa ghost to test the Brahman. He told him, the Buddha known as free from fear said, all activities are impermanent, characterized by production and extinction. Who said that? said the Brahman. The Rakshasa ghost, who was hideously ugly, appeared and said, I was just quoting a verse spoken by the Buddha who is free from fear. But you didn't recite the entire verse, only the first half. Please complete it, said the Brahman. I don't have the energy because I haven't eaten for several days. Find me something to eat and I will speak it for you, the ghost said. What would you like? asked the Brahman. I don't eat anything but fresh, warm human meat, said the ghost. In that case, replied the Brahman. You may speak the verse and then I will give you my own body to eat. The ghost stared at him. Can you really do such an awesome deed? Can you really give up your body for half a verse? I speak the truth, I do not lie, said the Brahman. And if you don't believe me, I can ask the Buddhas of the Ten Directions to bear testimony to the fight. Now recite the verse and then I will feed you. The ghost quickly recited, all activities are impermanent, characterized by production and extinction. When production and extinction are extinguished, that still extinction is bliss.
Now give me your body. Wait a minute, said the Brahman. Once you have eaten me there, there will be nothing left of the verse unless I write it down. Let me carve it on this tree so that future generations may cultivate according to it. Then he stripped the bark from a tree and carved the verse on its trunk. The ghost said, Can I eat you now? Just a minute, said the Brahman. So you're backing out, are you? The ghost said. No, I'm not, said the Brahman. But what I have written on the tree will eventually be worn away by the wind and rain. I want to carve the verse in stone so that it will last forever. I'm gladly give you my body, but I must also leave the Buddha Dharma for those of the future. Not a bad idea, said the ghost. The Brahman carved the words in stone and said, All right, I've done the, what I had to do. I give my body to you as an offering. You may eat me now. And he shut his eyes and waited for the ghost to devour him. But just then the ghost flew up into empty space, transformed himself back into chakra and said, Very good, very good. You're a true cultivator, one who gives up his own body for the sake of the Buddha way. In the future, you are sure to become a Buddha. This is an event in the former life of Shakyamuni Buddha, when as a Brahman, he offered his life for half a verse. Sutra, the master said, what are your doubts? All living beings have two bodies. Shi Tao replied, the physical body and the drama body. The physical body is impermanent and is produced and destroyed. The drama body is permanent and is without knowing or awareness. The sutra says that the extinction of production, production and extinction is in bliss, but I do not know which body is in tranquil extinction and which receives the bliss. How could it be the physical body which receives the bliss when this physical body is extinguished, the four elements scatter? That is totally suffering and a suffering cannot be called bliss. If the drama body was extinguished, it would become like grass, trees, tires, or stones. Then what would receive the bliss? Moreover, the drama nature is the substance of the production and extinction, and the five heaps are the function of production and extinction. With one body having five functions, production and extinctions, uh, pr production and extinction are permanent. At the time of production, the functions arise from the substance, and at the time of extinction, the functions return to the substance. If there were rebirth, then sentient beings would not cease to exist or be extinguished. If there were not rebirth, they would return to tranquil extinction and be just like insentient objects. Thus, all dharmas would be suppressed by nirvana and there would not even be production. How would there be bliss? The master said, You're a son of Shakya. How can you hold the Devon views of annihilationism and permanence which belongs to other religions and criticize the supreme vehicle drama? According to what you say, there is a drama body that exists apart from physical form and a tranquil extinction to be sought apart from production and extinction. Moreover, you propose that there is a body which enjoys the permanence and bliss of nirvana, but that is to grasp tightly onto birth and death and indulge in worldly bliss. Commentary It is the physical body which is extinct and the drama body which receives the bliss Shri Tao wanted to know, or is it the Dharma body which is extinct and the physical body which receives the bliss? How could it be the physical body which receives the bliss? The body is composed of the elements earth, air, fire, and water. At death, the elements scatter, and that is a state of unspeakable suffering. You can't call suffering happiness. Hey, said the great master, you are a disciple of Shakyamuni Buddha. 
you have left home and are a member of the Sangha. How can you harbor the daring views and daring knowledge of non-Buddhist religions? You can say that there is a Dharma body apart from the physical body and its extinction and that there is a tranquil extinction apart from the process of production and extinction. Isn't this what you're saying? You also say that there is a body which enjoys the four virtues of Nibbana, permanence, bliss, true self, and purity. In fact, your theories are nothing but niggardly attachment to birth and death and worldly pleasure. Stuck in the mundane world, you cannot possibly know transcendental bliss. Sutra, you should know how that deluded people mistook the union of five heaps for their own bodies and discriminated dramas as the external to themselves. They loved life, dreaded death, and drifted from thought to thought, not knowing that this illusory dream is empty and false. They turned vainly around on the wheel of birth and death and mistook the permanence and bliss of Nibbana for a form of suffering. All day long, they sought after something else. Taking pity on them, the Buddha made manifest in the space of an instant the true bliss of Nibbana, which has no mark of production or extinction. It has no production or extinction to be extinguished. That then is the manifestation of tranquil extinction. Its manifestation cannot be reckoned. It is permanent and blissful. The bliss has neither enjoyer nor a non-enjoyer. How can you call it one substance with five functions? Words, how can you say that Nibbana suppresses all dharmas, causing them to be forever unproduced, that is to slander the Buddha and defame the drama? Commentary, the Buddha spoke for those who thought that their bodies were actually made up of a union of the five heaps and who thought dramas were something external to themselves. They were attached to life and death because they didn't know that everything is like a dream, a bubble, a lightning flash, or a dew drop illusory. They underwent birth and death over and over again, uselessly, uselessly and pitifully spinning on the wheel of the six paths of rebirth. Some people thought that the wonderful virtues of Nirvana were a kind of suffering, but the Buddha mercifully revealed to them the true happiness of Nirvana. Where there is no mark of production and no mark of extinction, further there is absolutely no extinction of production and extinction because right within production and extinction there appears the state of non-production and non-extinction that is the manifestation of tranquil extinction. You can't say that the manifestation of tranquil extinction is so long and so short, is so long or so short, so high or so wide. It's a kind of permanent happiness which is without an enjoyer or a non-enjoyer. If you would like to have this kind of happiness, you should know that there is no one who enjoys it or does not enjoy it. Why? It is the manifestation of the original self-nature. Sutra, listen to my verse. Supreme Great Nirvana is bright, perfect, permanent, still and shining. Deluded common people call it death. Other teachings hold it to be annihilation. All those who seek two vehicles regard it as non-action. Ultimately, these notions arise from feeling and form the basis for 62 views, wrongly establishing unreal names. What is the true, real principle? Only one who has gone beyond measuring penetrates without grasping or rejecting and knows that the drama of the five heaps and the self within the heaps, the outward appearances, the mass of images, the mark of every sound are equally like the illusion of dreams. For him, views of common and holy do not arise. 
no uh, explanations of Nibbana made. The two boundaries, the three limits are cut off. All organs have their function, but there are never arises the thought of the function. All dhammas are discriminated without the thought of discrimination arising. When the fire at the ends and burns the bottom of the sea, and the winds blow the mountains against each other, the true permanent, still distinct bliss, the mark of Nibbana is thus. I have struggled to explain it, to cause you to reject your false views. Don't understand it by words alone, and maybe you'll understand a bit of this. After hearing this verse, Chu Tao was greatly enlightened, overwhelmed with joy. He made obeisance and withdrew. Commentary The Sikh Patriarch said, Listen, great Nirvana is full, complete, and bright. Is permanent, unchanging, and constantly illuminating. Ordinary people say that it is death, and those of non-Buddhist religions say that it is an annihilation. The two vehicles of the Shravakas and Pratyeka Buddhas think that it is non-action, that it is uncreated and arises spontaneously. But these are all discriminations which arise from emotion and they form the basis of 62 wrong views. What are the 62, uh, 62 wrong views? The heap scanda is big and am uh, contained the, in the heap. Two, I am big and the heap is contained in me. Three, the heap itself is me. Four, I am separate from the heap. When each of the four above are applied to the five heaps, from feelings, perceptions, impulses, and consciousness, they make twenty. The twenty multiplied by the three periods of time, past, present, and future, make sixty. Adding the two extremes of permanence and uh, annihilation makes sixty-two. None of them are real, they are all empty and false. Then, what is the true real principle? Only one who has gone beyond measuring penetrates without grasping at or rejecting them. Therefore, he truly understands that the drama of the five heaps and the self within those heaps and the marks of form and sound are all like dreams, illusions, bubbles, and shadows. For him, views of common and holy do not arise. He doesn't have the views of a common person. He doesn't have the understanding of the sage, and he doesn't try to explain the bliss of Nibbana. The two boundaries, the three limits, are cut off. He is attached neither to the boundary of emptiness nor to the boundary of existence. Therefore, the three limits of the past, present, and future are cut off, and he is not attached to them. All organs have their function, but their never arises the thought of the function. The true suchness, self-nature, has the ability to function in accord with external conditions and yet not change. Its responsiveness is inexhaustible and yet there is no thought of, ah, I am functioning. All dramas are discriminated without a thought of, of discrimination arising. You don't think I am making discriminations. If you do think that, you have a mark of discrimination. To be truly without discrimination is to be without the mark of non-discrimination as well. When the fire at the end of the end burns the bottom, burns the bottom of the sea, and the wind blows the mountains against each other. At the end of an end, there are three disasters, food, flood, fire, and wind. The true permanent, still, extinct bliss, the mark of Nirvana, is thus. If you have attained true permanence and the bliss of tranquil extinction, then the mark of Nirvana is just as it was explained above, and the three disasters cannot affect you. The great master concludes by saying that he has spoken the verse to encourage his listeners to cast aside their present knowledge and views. When you no longer rely on the text in order to explain the sutras, he said, 
I will grant that you understand just a little bit of what I've said. Be sure, sing to. Sutra Diana Master Singh Tzu was born into the Leo family, which lived in An Trung district in Chu Chou. Hearing of the flourishing influence of the Tao Tzu Drama Assembly, Tzu Tzu went directly there to pay homage and asked what is required to avoid falling into successive stages. The Master said, What did you do before coming here? He replied, I did not even practice the holy truths. The master said, Then into what successive stage could you fall? He replied, If one isn't practicing the four holy truths, what successive stages are there? The master greatly admired his capacity and made him the leader of the assembly. One day the master said, You should go elsewhere to teach. Do not allow the teaching to be cut off. Having obtained the drama, Sing Tzu returned to Qing Yuan Mountain in Chuchou to propagate the drama and transform living beings. After his death, he was given the posthumous title, Diana Master Hong Chu. Commentary Diana Master Sing Tzu walked and thought about things at the same time. What did he think about? Do you know? I know. He walked and thought. Who is mindful of the Buddha? Who is mindful of the Buddha? And so he was called Sing Tzu, walking thinker. At that time, the reputation of the Dharma Assembly at Cao Tzu had spread all over China. Everyone knew that the, the person to whom the fifth patriarch had transmitted the robe and bow was spreading the Dharma there. People drift away from the empty and gather with the flourishing. If there are only a few people in your place, it will soon be empty. For instance, here there are 30 people, but if there were only 3 or 4 people, soon they would all run away. The more people there are, the more will come from the outside. There are a lot of people at the Buddhist lecture hall. Hippies who go there, cut their hair, and shave their beards. It's inconceivable. There must be something happening there. Let's go and see. The drama assembly at Cao Tzu flourished. Gather with the flourishing can also be explained as gather with the sages, because in Chinese the words flourishing and sage sound the same. Many sages and common people came to support the patriarch. Sing Tzu asked asked the patriarch which Dharma door she would cultivate in order to avoid the successive stages, stages of the gradual teaching. The sudden teaching does not have successive stages. Therefore, what he actually asked was, how do I cultivate the sudden Dharma? He must have heard someone say the sixth patriarch is truly inconceivable. He has the five eyes and the six spiritual penetrations. I went there and didn't say a thing, and he knew what I was thinking and asked me about it. The master regarded Sing Tzu highly. What this man says makes sense, he thought. He surely must have good rules. He appointed Sing Tzu head of the assembly and Thereafter, Sing Tzu always walked in front, leading the others during the ceremonies. The sixth patriarch saw Sing Tzu was a vessel of the drama, a drama door, elephant, and dragon. This means that he had the capability of a patriarch, not a self made patriarch, but one who had received the sixth patriarch's certification and permission to teach. Go and teach elsewhere said the master you should not stay here with me but should go in such and such a direction to be a teaching master do not let the drama become extinct sing tzu received the rope and bow and carried the transmission of the lamp of the wonderful drama the posthumous title was conferred by the emperor sing tzu was given the name hung chu extensive crossing. 
Just as the Sikh patriarch received the name Tatachian Great Mirror, Dhyana Master Huai Chang. Sutra Dhyana Master Huai Chang was the son of the two family in Chintrao. He first visited National Master An of Sung Mountain, who told him to go to Tao Tzu to pay homage. When he arrived, he bowed, and the master asked him, What has come? He replied, Sung Shan. The master said, What thing is it, and how does it come? He replied, To say that is like a thing is to miss the point. The master said, Then, can there still be that which is cultivated and certified? He replied, Cultivation and certification are not absent, but there can be no defilement. The master said, It is just the lack of defilement of which all Buddhas are mindful and protective. You are like that, and I am like that too. In the West, Pranatara predicted that a coit would run from under your feet, trampling and killing people under heaven. You should keep that in mind, but do not speak of it too soon. Huang Chang suddenly understood. According, accordingly, he waited upon the master for 15 years, daily penetrating more deeply into the profound and mysterious. He later went to Nanyang, where he spread the Diana school. The title Diana Master Ta Hui was bestowed upon him posthumously. Commentary Huai Chang received the drama transmission from the great master and became the seventh patriarch. Huai means to cherish. What did he cherish? Chang, which means to yield. He was never arrogant toward anyone but kept his mind humble and modest, respecting everyone above and below him. In his mind, he always cherished politeness. What this Diana master had, he appeared to be without. What was real appeared false. Although he had the way, he seemed as though he didn't. He was utterly highly educated, but if anyone brought it up, he politely insisted that insisted that he was just he was really just a beginner. He first went to study the Buddha Dharma with National Master An. National Master An sent him to study at Tao Tzu because at that time everyone knew that Tao Tzu was the place of the true orthodox Buddha Dharma. If you really wanted to study and cultivate faith in the Buddha Dharma, you went to Tao Tzu. Now, in America, if you really want to study the Buddha Dharma, you should come and study the sutras here. Don't fear difficulty. Don't fear suffering. Don't be lazy. Study the Buddha Dharma. At that time, at Nanhua Temple, the site of the platform of the Sikh Patriarch, there was dhyana meditation and work on the mountain slopes every day. Everyone got up at 30, at 3.30 in the morning. At 4 o'clock, they went to morning recitation, which was very vigorous and lasted until 5.30. Then they sat in meditation until sunrise. After he had eaten some rice and gruel, there was another hour of meditation. At 8 o'clock, they went out on the mountain slopes for two hours until 10 o'clock because there were about 2,000 people. In two hours, they were able to do a lot of work. It was not like one or two people doing the work and not being able to finish it. At 10, they returned from the slopes and rested until 11, at which time they ate. From 12 to 2, they sat in meditation, and at 2 o'clock, they went back out on the mountain slopes to work for two more hours. Then they returned and sat in meditation for six hours, until 10 o'clock. Afterwards, some did their own work, bowing in homage to the sutras or performing repentance shed ceremonies until midnight. Every day it was this way. The wind of the way blew severely in Nan at Nanhua Temple. Everyone had to follow the rules. 
There were several thousand pupils, and you never heard a person speak. No one spoke because they feared that they might strike up false thinking, and then their work would not succeed. If you single-mindedly apply your thought, you never pursue any train of random thought whatsoever. The Sith Patriarch therefore established work in common, which was very rigorous. When Dinner Master Huai Chang arrived at Nanhua Temple, he bowed. He bowed, and the master said, "What has come? This is Chen. In the Chen school, one never speaks of the principle outright. He merely said, 'What has come?'" Ostensibly, it was a big shoe, but he said what comes. At least he didn't ask if it was a ghost. Huang Chang, Huai Chang replied, "Sung Shan." He meant, "I am from Sung Mountain." The two were using the language of the Chen School. Reparty, cultivation, and certification are not absent, but there can be no defilement. Cultivation has that which is cultivated, and certification has that which is certifi- certified. Therefore, cultivation and certification are not non-existent. So, cultivation and certification can exist, but defilement cannot. That is, you cannot be stained. The self-nature must be bright and light. When Huai Chang said this, the master replied. That there was no defilement, no filth in the self nature. In the self nature, the defilements are self-seeking, jealousy, greed, hate, and delusion. Without these defilements, he said, "You are thus, just as I am. We two are the same equal." The twenty-seventh Indian patriarch, Pranatara, the predecessor, predecessor. The predecessor of Bodhidharma had said that the coit would run from under Huai Chang's feet. Who was the coit? He was Huai Chang's Dharma successor, Great Master Ma Su, Hor's patriarch Tao Yi. Under your feet means that the coit would be Huai Chang's disciple because a disciple behaves as if. He were under his teacher's foot. In the future, Pranatara had said, "A coit will run out of your gate, trampling people all over the world. No other drama master will match his superb elegance and vast wisdom. None will defeat him. Under heaven, he will be supreme." Master Huai Chang became the sixth patriarch's personal attendant. Later, he went to Hong Mountain. In Nanyao, which is in Hunan Province in South Central China, to propagate the Dianan School. After Huai Chang died, the Emperor gave him the title Great Master Tahui, Great Wisdom.